33. First of all, the particular congregation. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. To whom is our Lord Jesus speaking? And to whom is he appealing in this particular text or statement from his Sermon on the Mount? Which people is he speaking to in these tremendous and challenging words? Well, it seems to me that Matthew chapter 5, verse 1 and 2 provides the answer, if we can just look at the verses. And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying. Now, Christ's Sermon on the Mount commences in chapter 5. It continues in chapter 6. And it doesn't conclude until we reach the end of chapter 7. So the Sermon on the Mount spans three whole chapters. And here, right at the commencement of that sermon, we <coughs> are <coughs> introduced to those whom Christ is addressing and to whom he speaks primarily in this remarkable and wonderful teaching. He was set, and his disciples came unto him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, that is, his disciples. You hardly need me to explain, I'm sure, that the term disciple literally means a learner, a pupil, one who follows both the teacher and the teaching. And you see, there were gathered before Christ as he sat in the mount, the multitude apart, a band of truly ardent and devoted adherence to him. In the words of Matthew Henry, these followed him for love and learning, while others attended him only for cures. I like that. So the multitudes follow Christ. They are only interested in what they can receive from him for their own blessing, for their own benefit. But gathering in the mountain with Christ is a smaller company of people, just a small band, a handful, relatively speaking, of men whose hearts God Almighty has touched, who are ardent and devoted to Christ, and they are following him out of love and out of a real genuine desire to learn of him and to be like him. Now, whilst it is clear that the multitudes were within earshot of Christ, and so in that sense they would hear his sermon, they would listen to the principles which he laid down for his disciples, yet I believe that in the main, the Sermon on the Mount was directed and dedicated to those who would become foundational members in the kingdom of God, spiritually speaking. And Christ here laid in them the very principles of the kingdom through these three remarkable chapters. And it is my submission that all that the disciples were and all that they did, they owed to what Christ laid in them at this particular time, as well as on other occasions. You will recall that there is a reference in the short epistle to Jude to the faith which was once delivered to the saints. You could not have a greater or grander summary of the faith than what Christ delivered to his disciples in his Sermon on the Mount. I believe here, in a nutshell, is that faith for which we all have to earnestly contend. It was once delivered to the saints, and I believe that what Christ laid in them made them what they were. And the twelve, of course, became mighty apostles of the Lamb and became men of renown and men of outstanding ability and authority. And I do believe today, as I have prayed, that God has impressed upon my spirit that if we at Carabas will imbibe the teaching which Christ laid in the disciples, then we too can rise to a new dimension of spiritual life and power and authority. I am utterly convinced of that. 
I believe God wants to come right down to where we are. He wants to open our eyes. He wants to attract us and arrest us, to draw us out, to seek after him like never before, to lay within us the principles of the kingdom, and to raise a superstructure in our hearts and in our lives that will be a monument to his own praise and glory. Amen. And so it's exciting as we commence, I trust, tonight's particular Bible study. And so the particular congregation whom Christ addresses, to whom Christ speaks and talks in such plain and powerful terms, is initially that small band of those who follow Christ for love and for learning. He refers to them, and you have it in Matthew chapter 5, verse 13 and 14, as being the salt of the earth and the light of the world. What a very, very wonderful description of those who are to be subjects of the spiritual kingdom of God, the salt of the earth and the light of the world. And time permitting, we'll come back to that. And as Christ addresses them, I believe we have, and I just coined this phrase this afternoon in the context of Matthew 5, what I would call the manifesto of the kingdom. What a wonderful privilege the disciples had of being present with Christ when the kingdom, spiritually speaking, was being established and from that point was being extended. They were with him in the beginning. They were the first to hear his manifesto for the kingdom. And I am certain sure that they imbibed it and laid hold upon it. And this formed the basis of all their preaching and their proclaiming in Christ and for Christ. And as we consider tonight, I'm sure that some of the manifesto of the kingdom will become more plain and real to us. Initially, as we consider the particular congregation, three thoughts. Firstly, the position of Christ. Did you notice from verse 1 how the Holy Ghost has specifically stated concerning Christ that he was set in the mountain? Verse 1, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him. Now let me explain. That little word set indicates not a casual position, but rather a careful and deliberate posture. Christ was not just sitting any old how in the mount, but he set himself consciously, deliberately, in a certain posture with a certain end and aim in view. It is a fact if you read history, particularly in the Judaistic context, that whenever the rabbinical fathers gave teaching, important and vital teaching, to the people, they never stood. They always, but always sat. And the sign of a master, the sign of a teacher, was this, that before he commenced to teach, he would set himself and his pupils would gather around him and would quite literally sit at his feet. It's interesting to read the testimony of the Apostle Paul in Acts 22 and verse 3. And he testified that he had been brought up at the feet of Gamaliel and taught according to the perfect manner of the Lord of the Fathers. And here this particular point is emphasized. Paul had been brought up at the feet of Gamaliel. Gam Gamaliel had set himself. His pupils, his learners, had gathered around him. And as they sat at his feet, they were taught according to the perfect manner of the Lord of the Fathers. And of course, this custom of the teacher being set in a careful, deliberate posture with those who are being taught gathered around him has been perpetuated right down the centuries. It is interesting that in Rome today, whenever the Pope speaks supposedly ex cathedra, which means to say that he gives infallible judgment on matters of uh, faith and morals, he always takes his seat. And there is a seat in the Vatican known as the teacher's chair. And when the Pope feels that he is about to pontificate in uh, an infallible manner, he takes that seat and everyone listens with rapt attention. The pontiff 
is to give judgment on matters of faith and morals. Even to this day, our institutions of learning and education refer to the teacher's chair or the professor's chair. <coughs> My good friend Werner Wright, who is a professor at Leeds University, shared with me rather humorously when he was made a professor and upon him was conferred the privilege of a chair in a certain department in the Leeds University. He said, you know, I've never seen the chair and I've never sat in it in that sense. But it means that I am now privileged to teach. And he said, I have reg regular teaching sessions and uh, when I walk into the lecture room, they all gather around me. I am the professor, they are my pupils and I teach with the authority of the university behind me. And I like to consider here in Matthew 5 that the Lord Jesus Christ said himself quite deliberately, quite consciously, realizing that he was cast in the role of the teacher and these his disciples were to gather at his feet and he was to instruct them like no one else had ever instructed them. And he was to lay in them the precepts and the principles of the kingdom. And I tell you tonight, I for one, during this series, want to sit at the feet of Jesus. In that sense, I don't want anyone to sit at the feet of Keith Skelton. Perhaps it is significant that whereas all the teachers take their seat when they teach, I take to my feet for a good hour or so. But whilst Keith Skelton is standing, thanks be to God, our Lord Jesus Christ is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. And my prayer has been today that he, the great teacher, will see us gathered not around Keith Skelton, but gathered around his feet, and he will send a prophetic word through these studies that will grip us and possess us and make us the kind of people he longs that we should be. So I trust that you with me tonight will recognize Christ is the master, Christ is the teacher, he is set, and we gather at his feet, and we in effect say, Lord Jesus Christ, say on. Speak to us. We are now ready to listen and to heed thy precious word. Now then, if we are truly his disciples, then we shall follow him for love and for learning. And we shall be his pupils, and he will teach us, for we shall be teachable. It's beautiful to me to see how that when he was said, his disciples instinctively came unto him. Read that verse again. When he was said, his disciples came unto him. And the whole gist is the moment they saw him take, carefully and deliberately, a certain posture, they moved forward. They knew that they were about to hear things absolutely prophetic and significant. And they gathered around his feet, and they were teachable, and he taught them. You know, one of the great problems with us, if we're honest, is that very often we are not teachable. Not here at Carabas, I mean in every other place, but not here. <laughs> but you know, this is the problem, isn't it? We like to feel that we know quite a lot, if not everything. And down the years, I've met a good few people who have moved from church to church because they are not prepared to receive teaching or ministry from any leader, from any minister. They know it all. No one's going to teach them. I remember... <clears throat> In my first pastor, one man taking the wind right out of my sails after one Bible study, he said, young man, you will never, never teach me. I have no need that any man should teach me. And when I saw him go out of the door of the church, I sighed a sigh of relief and prayed for the minister of the next church that he would visit, I tell you. But there are people like that, aren't there? They have no need of teaching. But I tell you this, friends, it doesn't matter how long we've been saved. How long we've been on the way, we need to come as the disciples of Jesus, as those who follow him out of love and out of learning and sit at his feet and imbibe the principles of the kingdom until Christ reigns and rules in our hearts and in our lives and shapes us up for a visitation of the power and authority of God amongst us. So note the position of Christ. Secondly, will you note the passion of Christ? Matthew 5, 2. He opened his mouth and taught them, saying. Now, I know that at first reading, that just seems to be quite a basic statement of fact. He opened his mouth and began to teach them.
But I suggest to you that there is more in that than meets the eye. One of the ancients comments, Christ taught much without opening his mouth. That is by his holy and exemplary life. He taught when, being led as a lamb to the slaughter, he opened not his mouth. But now he opened his mouth and taught. And the more I prayed around this simple statement, the more I came to the conclusion that Christ opened his mouth, not simply to speak, but to give expression to the very passion which possessed his heart. In other words, he could remain silent no longer. He had taught the, the disciples by precept and by example. But now there is so much in his heart. And he must open his mouth and speak to release the pressure and to let the flow of divine truth come through him to those who were gathered around him. And I must confess tonight, I feel as we get into this, that I am opening my mouth, not just to speak, but to give vent to what is in here. I couldn't help but think, and I'm sure you've read it in Job 32, of Elihu, that great man who came and spoke to Job and to Job's three friends. And it's very, very interesting when you read what Elihu had to say. This is what he testified to Job and his friends. I am full of matter. The spirit within me constraineth me. Behold, my belly is as wine, which hath no vent. It is ready to burst like new bottles. Have you ever had that sort of experience? Elihu stands before Job and his friends, and he says, I'm so full of matter. My spirit constraineth me. Behold, my belly is as wine which hath no vent. If I don't get this off my chest, if I don't tell you what I think and what I believe, I'm going to burst. That's what Elihu was saying. And I'm utterly convinced, and I say it reverently, that when our Lord Jesus set, set himself in the mount, knowing what he was going to share with the disciples, he had something of that experience. And when he opened his mouth, it wasn't simply to speak words. It was to release the pressure and to allow that which was within him to pour forth into the disciples and to possess them and change them and transform them from that moment on. And I would love to believe that in this series we would receive something of that from our blessed Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Not mere words, but we would feel the very prophetic flame of ministry. We would feel the very power and authority of what Jesus is sharing with us. We would feel a sense that the Lord has gathered us together, not simply to tickle our ears, but to pour into us something which will change us forevermore and make us more effective and more influential in the kingdom of God. God grant that it shall be. Thirdly, will you notice the penetration of Christ? In his Sermon on the Mount, Christ lays the axe to the root of the tree. He penetrates, he cuts through the traditions and trappings of mere religion, and he touches on matters of the heart. And he spells out to the disciples, for example, that he demanded and expected of them a righteousness which would exceed the righteousness of the scribes and of the Pharisees. And he made it very, very clear what attitude he expected to be developed in them and what their spirit was to be as subjects of the kingdom of God. And I confess as I've read Matthew 5, 6 and 7, I have said to the Lord, without your gracious help, we cannot make it. We cannot attain to this high and lofty standard. You reveal to us things which are beyond us, naturally speaking, yet I believe in God. He can help us. And by the communication of the divine nature and the word of God can develop in us a righteous attitude, a righteous spirit, a righteousness of the inner man that will exceed by a million worlds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees will not exceed in quantity, but will exceed in quality, a different kind of righteousness. And I tell you, even in Edinburgh, Jesus Christ needs to help us in this matter. We have so much religion in the city. 
and yet so much apathy and lethargy and indifference. We need more reality. And maybe God has to deliver us from the traditions and formalism of religion and bring us into a spiritual area where we touch a righteousness which is of Christ and in Christ and is only available and accessible in the Savior. I believe it will be so. And so we consider the particular congregation, the disciples, as Christ sets himself, they gather around him, he opens his mouth and he begins to teach them. And now we come to Matthew 6.33. By the time we reach this point in Christ's Sermon on the Mount, he is really beginning to apply the truth and to put the disciples under pressure. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. My second point, the prime consideration, the prime consideration. See, what is to be the prime consideration in the hearts of those who claim to be his followers, who claim to be his pupils, who claim to be subjects of the kingdom of God? Well, their prime consideration is the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, etc. Now that word first is interesting. It is used of place, of order, of time, and of rank. In other words, Jesus Christ is saying to his disciples, look, you want to follow me, fine. You want to learn of me? Fine. You want to be my pupils? You want to enter into the kingdom of God and you want the kingdom of God in principle and precept and power to enter into you? Fine. Well, then you make sure that you sort out your hearts and your lives so that the prime consideration is the kingdom of God and his righteousness. What Jesus was saying was this. The kingdom of God must have first place in your lives. Everything else must come second. Now it's more easily said than done, isn't it? It must have first place. The kingdom of God must come first before husband, wife, family, home, job, possessions, prospects, earthly associations and friendships and all the rest of it. The kingdom of God has to come first. And I've done some heart searching today, I tell you. And my prayer has been, God, bring me to the place. Bring us all to the place where we say to God, all that we have and all that we are is as nothing. We set ourselves to seek, firstly, the kingdom of God and his righteousness. It has to come first. Secondly, we have to seek first the kingdom of God and see that that is first in order of all our priorities. It was Jimmy Reed, and I don't have much sympathy with him, but he speaks some good sense every now and again, who once sent, said in uh, a well-publicized speech that today, generally speaking, in industry and in commerce, we are in a rat race. And he said, comrades and colleagues, the rat race is for rats. Get out of it. Well, that makes sense. I tell you, friends, today there's a rat race in this world. And it's so easy to be caught up in it. Where the things of time and earth and sense demands so much of us, makes such heavy claims upon us that we find we are spending all of our time pursuing these. I remember talking in my business days to one company director who was going through a time of great difficulty and he was totally depressed. And he turned to me and he said, Skelton, what is business all about? Dog eat dog, that's business. And I wondered what he meant, but then I understood. Dog eats dog. 
he'd got caught up in the rat race. He'd trodden on and trampled on many of his colleagues and friends to get where he was. He didn't care about anything or anyone. But then he found the others were doing it to him, and there was no end to it. And he was tired and sick of living that kind of life. And I was able to share with him the life that is found in Jesus Christ. My dear friends, number one priority for every one of us is not promotion, is not a bigger bank balance, not a new car, not a bigger or a better house, not this or that or the other, but the prime consideration is the kingdom of God first and foremost and everything else taking second place. Thirdly, Christ is saying, look, the kingdom of God must have first claim upon your time. It's good to see you here tonight. It really is, and I bless you for coming. And it's right and proper that when there is fellowship and ministry in the house of God, we should be here. Now, I'm sure that some of you feel tired tonight, don't you? Some of you look tired. I say that lovingly. One or two are nearly nodding off. <laughs> Stay with us if you can. But some of you are tired. And uh, after dinner or supper, you felt more inclined to relaxing in the fireside chair than making the effort to come out to Carabas. But bless your heart, you've said, no, Lord, you have a prior claim upon my time. And I wouldn't dream of sitting back on a Tuesday evening and just resting and relaxing and uh, falling asleep. And I wouldn't dream of just switching on the old box and watching all that nonsense. I feel that you have a claim upon my time and Tuesday evening is dedicated and devoted to you. And as long as I've got health and strength and ability, I'll be there in the house of God because nothing is more important than that. And you take that principle. And when the kingdom of God makes claims upon us, God expects that we should suitably respond to them and see to it that nothing but nothing claims our time more than the kingdom of God. I remember in my first pastor, and I had lots of fun, believe me, one lady saying to me, you understand why I can't come to the Bible study? We had the Bible study in those days on a Monday evening, but she said, I've always done my weekly wash on a Monday. And if my husband gets home and finds all the washing out on the maiden or on the radiators, he gets cross. I have to wash whilst he's at work. I have to dry it. I have to iron it and put it away before ever he comes in. Now, if you husbands are like that, you repent. And you'll be more understanding. And she said, by the time I've done all that, I'm so tired and so wet. That was a good Lancashire expression. She said, I just cannot make it to the Bible study. So I said to her, sister, why don't you change your wash day? Oh, no, she said. I've done it for years. And uh, I've gotten into the habit. I've gotten into the routine. I said, I prophesy something. If you change your wash day to a Tuesday, you'll have the whitest wash you've ever had. I said, you will never see the colors run, and uh, you will have a perfect drying day, and you'll iron it, and instead of being half dead when your husband gets home, you'll be full of life and full of joy, and he'll wonder what on earth is the matter with you. She said, I'll take you at your word. And she did. And she came back and she said, it worked. It worked. And friends, I tell you, it pays. It really pays to put the kingdom first, doesn't it? And you see, in practical areas, when you think of the things that hold us back from the kingdom, but I do this, but I do that, but so-and-so comes, but I'm expected to go here and go there. And very often, all these things have no relevance to our spiritual growth and development. And we need to cut through all the incidental and trivial and really begin to let the kingdom of God have first claim upon our time. And then it must come first in terms of rank. Now, you know, the Lord Jesus, when he censored the church at Ephesus, had something very interesting to say. You have lost your first love. Now, I've heard many a preacher comment on that, that uh, Christ meant that they had lost the love which they had for him at the first. But in actual fact, that is not so. Christ was saying the chief love, the prime love, that love which ranked first in your life, that love for me you have lost. And you have now allowed other things to crowd in and to draw you away after them. 
And I feel tonight, my dear brothers and sisters, that the prime consideration for every one of us is that the kingdom of God must rank above all else in our lives and experiences. And we are prepared to make any sacrifice to adjust our lives to any degree, in any way necessary, in order that the kingdom of God might come first in our life and we might give ourselves to an ardent and fervent seeking after God. And I tell you this, if we do this, we shall have revival in Carabas. Amen. Amen. I believe if we do this, we shall have revival. For when men and women are seeking first the kingdom of God, God Almighty is going to come to them with the authority and power of the kingdom and release them to enter in to all that he has promised and pledged for. And so here is the primary consideration. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Now are we ready for this? Are we ready tonight to say, God helping me as I leave Carabas? The kingdom of God will have first place in my life. It will head the list of all my priorities. It will have first claim upon my time. This will rank above all else as number one in my heart from this time. Secondly, or thirdly, let me speak to you about the positive connotation in the text. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. That little word seek is interesting. It means strive to find. With a view not simply to finding but possessing. That's lovely isn't it? Not just seeking to find for the sake of finding. But seeking to find. In order to possess. And embrace. And take to oneself. And Jesus is saying look. Seek ye. Those of you who want to be my followers, who want to be my pupils, who want to be my disciples, who want to be my learners, those who want to be subjects of my kingdom, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Let this be the first and prime consideration of your hearts and of your lives. And really seek the kingdom of God. Not casually or superficially, but ardently fervently with all the passion of your heart seek the kingdom of God in order that you might embrace its realities and enter experientially into all that the kingdom of God represents and stands for now in this series we could seek the kingdom of God simply to further or complete our theological education and our minds could be enlightened but I am absolutely certain that God wants us to seek the kingdom of God so that we might enter into it and it might enter into us and we might embrace and possess the very authority and power of that kingdom for ourselves and if we do this then I believe our lives will be revolutionized may God help us thus to seek to seek in order to possess you see, there are many professors around today, aren't there? But few possessors. And really, if we're honest, one of the problems we have in Christendom, so-called, is that so many profess to know Christ, but so few possess Christ in reality and in truth. And we could talk tonight about the kingdom, we could argue, we could discuss, we could debate, we could fall out one with another. And maybe we would never cross every T and dot every I. But what God wants in us is not just a seeking after knowledge, but a seeking after an experiential knowledge of the kingdom of God in all of its fullness and in all of its power. And the word of God to us tonight is to seek in this way the kingdom of God until we find it, until we possess it, until we embrace it, until here in Carabas, we know experientially that kingdom living and moving and progressing in our hearts and in our fellowship. Amen. And I tell you, when that comes, we are all going to be changed. And I've had a thrilling time today because I prayed over you. 
generally, and I prayed over some of you personally and particularly, and I've seen you changed. And I've seen you like you've never seen yourself today, some of you. And I said, oh God, if they will really seek, I can see what could happen. They could be turned upside down and inside out and suddenly saying, I found the kingdom. I've embraced it. I possessed it. It's within me. And now I am enjoying that order of things, that level of things, which hitherto I've only sought to know theologically and doctrinally, but now it's mine. Praise the Lord. The positive connotation. Fourthly, let me share concerning the powerful constitution of this kingdom. But seek ye first the kingdom of God, the basilii of God, the reign, the rule of God in Christ. Can I just recap? When we talk about the kingdom, we are talking about the dominion of the king. We are talking about a state of sovereignty, which of necessity demands the presence and influence of a sovereign. I believe, my brothers and sisters tonight, that we can reach a point in God where God in Christ is reigning and ruling in our hearts and in our lives and in our fellowship. I believe that. I believe we can know a state of sovereignty. I believe by the presence and influence of the King, something majestic can take place within us. Do you believe that? And this is why I'm praying and believing for something special here in Carabas. Forgive me. I'm utterly prejudiced and biased. Inasmuch as I f feel that there is the potential here for something quite unique. Not for Keith Skelton to be reigning or ruling. Not for the directors to be reigning or ruling. But for God Almighty in Christ to be reigning in this place. And for there to be a state of sovereignty in Carabas with a powerful constitution set up by God Almighty, where the whole thing is ordered on the basis of divine revelation, and where we conform to the truth of God, and where God is taking us on in unprecedented power and authority and blessing. Now, I can hardly wait for the time when Jesus Christ reigns literally in this world. I'm looking forward to that, aren't you? I want to see every knee bowing. I want to hear every tongue confessing that Jesus Christ is Lord. And during the millennium, I'm going to flit around the, the world. And I'm going to touch all six continents. And I'm going to stand in front of Gentile kings and watch them go down on bended knee and hear them confess Jesus Christ is Lord. And I shall say amen over every one of them. Amen. Hallelujah. I believe these things are going to happen. And friend, I believe they can happen spiritually speaking now in us and amongst us. I believe in Carabas every knee could bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. The kingdom is come. The presence and influence of the king has brought about a degree of sovereignty. And Jesus reigns in sovereignty and in majesty. Forgive me, I'm excited at the prospect. And I feel like Elihu that if I don't say this, I'm going to burst. So forgive me, won't you? I believe it with all of my heart. And friends, you can know it and I can know it. Sovereignty in your life, sovereignty in my life. God Almighty reigning and ruling in absolute power and authority. Till our lives know something of God that the natural carnal man could never envisage in a thousand millenniums. Wonderful. Little wonder Paul stated the kingdom of God is not in word but in power. We are tired of empty speeches, aren't we? Yes. If we're honest. The kingdom of God is not in word, in mere word, in empty speeches. And I say today, and the challenge comes to my heart, the answer, friends, for the desperate situation that faces us in the church is not sermons. Professional, polished sermons it is for prophetic ministry, for the flame of God to burn in the preacher's heart and to burn in the people's hearts, and for God by his word to get hold of the people, to lift them out of everything that would hinder and hold them back, and to bring them into an area of sovereign authority and power where God is in control and God is in command in Jesus Christ. And nothing short of this will meet the desire of our hearts and the crisis that we find the church of Jesus Christ in. 
And brothers, I believe it's coming. Amen. Amen. I believe it's coming. Now, I know that in many, many churches, they argue and fall out about the Constitution. Don't they? They've never done it in your church. No, it's always the church next door, isn't it? <laughs> but I've lived long enough to know that in many churches, in the annual general members' business meeting, uh, controversy rages around the Constitution. I shall never forget at one point in my pastoral ministry, to make it, taking a unilateral decision in a members' meeting, and someone said, you can't do it. I said, I've done it. <laughs> but they said, you can't. It's against the Constitution. I said, I've done it. But you can't. And this man stood up and he said, I've got a little book. And it's headed, Church Constitution, paragraph so-and-so, item three. You can't do it. I said, I've done it. Then he said, you violated the Constitution. I said, I violated the Constitution. And one of the elders shouted out, praise be to God. <laughs> I said, what do you mean? And he stood to his feet. He said, this little book has ruled us for years. We set it up to help us. And it's almost destroyed us. And he said, would to God we could find another constitution. I said, brother, I found one. I found one. And if you prepare to move away from that and come to this, we can have a constitution that won't kill us and destroy us, but will release us and set us free to serve God. And I believe, friends, here is the constitution of the church, the principles of the kingdom. And I believe that when God reigns and rules in us, he delivers us from tradition, delivers us, delivers us from man-made constitutions and rules and regulations and brings us into an area where the only thing that matters is the principle of the kingdom of God and all the revelation of truth that is wrapped up in that. And I believe it could happen in our hearts and in our lives. It is exciting, isn't it? Can you take a little bit more? All right, we'll keep on going. Hey, only two of you nodded then. <laughs> All right, we'll carry on. And then, fifthly, the plain construction of the statement. Notice here, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then all these things shall be added unto you. What other construction or interpretation could you place upon the statement than this? The kingdom of God is a righteous kingdom. That is the plain construction of the statement. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Some translators render that. Seek ye first God's righteous kingdom. Now, as we consider the kingdom tonight, we are considering the righteousness of God. We are considering right living before God. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. And you see, primarily, the kingdom of God is a righteous kingdom. And if we claim to be a part of that kingdom, yet we do not live righteously, we lie and we tell not the truth. For the apostle John laid it right on the line, he that doeth righteousness is righteous. He that doeth not righteous is not righteous. And you see, when we have said all, what matters is not what we have professed with our lips, but what we have produced with our lives in terms of righteous living before God, isn't it? So easy to say, so easy to profess. It's quite another thing to provide the evidence and the fruit of what we testify concerning. And the kingdom of God is a righteous kingdom. That's why Paul said in Romans 14, 17, the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness. And after that, peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. I'm very inclined to uh, share with you what Paul meant when he said the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but we would never get through the rest of this. It's very, very interesting. The kingdom of God is not about eating and drinking or even abstaining. And it's clear to me that in the church at Rome, there was controversy on this matter. Should we eat this or should we not? Should we drink this or should we not? And Paul was saying, look, the kingdom of God is nothing to do with eating and drinking. The kingdom of God is to do with righteousness, with right and proper attitude of heart and mind of spirit before the Lord. Don't we get bogged down at times with non-essentials, don't we? The first time I ever wore a colored shirt, 
as a minister, my wife will remember, I was torn off a strip by one of the elders. I shall never forget it as long as I live. Didn't stop me wearing the coloured shirt, but I shall never forget it. And it was my birthday and coloured shirts were just coming in. And my wife went out and bought me a very pale pink shirt. And I can remember to this day, I had a black pinstripe suit. And I put this on with a suitable tie. She said, it looks smashing. So I went to the church. I'd always wore a white shirt, nothing but a white shirt. So I turned up in this pale pink shirt and couldn't understand one of the elders all the way through the service had his head on his chest. I thought he was heavily burdened or concerned about something. And at the end of the meeting, he said, Pastor, I must object in the strongest of terms to the color of your shirt. I said, what's wrong with it? He said, it is an abomination in the sanctuary. Oh, dear. I said, I'm sorry. And he said, if you love me and if you care for me, you will not wear it tonight. And off he went. So I loved him and I cared for him. So I wore it. <laughs> <laughs> to let him see the kingdom of God was more than pink shirts. And he was most unhappy. The years have come and gone. And that fellow visited us in our church in Leeds with the brightest shirt you've ever seen, <laughs> I tell you. I said, Sid, it's just as well the kingdom of God is not meat and drink and color of shirt. And he went the color, I tell you, of beetroot. <laughs> oh, he said, God help us. I, should, I said, I shan't forget it. He said, neither will I. I said, you know, you and I could have come to blows, metaphorically speaking, over that. We could have had a breach in our fellowship. We could have fallen out over some incidental thing that God Almighty didn't even notice. The kingdom of God is about righteousness. And friends, I tell you, in many of our churches, we're utterly bogged down with trivialities, aren't we? We strain at a gnat and we swallow a camel. We have councils and committees debating and discussing non-essentials. Remember in one church where I was brought up, the oversight spent a whole evening discussing whether they should have linen towels or paper towels in the washrooms. And they failed to secure a two-thirds majority for either. So we had no towels. <laughs> and when I look back, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God, God have mercy upon us. Friends, it's infinitely higher than all of these things, isn't it? And I'm sure the brethren are one with me in Carabas. We just want to cut through all this. We have no time for it. Jesus is coming. Souls are lost and dying without him. We must get after the lost and win them for Christ. We must preach the word and see the believers built up in their most holy faith. We must prepare them for heaven. For heaven is coming and heaven is dawning. And God help any pastor who's wasted his time on non-essentials and has not developed the people in righteousness and brought them to maturity and perfection in Christ, for one day he shall give an account. And fancy standing before the Lord and saying, well, Lord, I was so busy arguing with the deacons as to what color the church should be painted, arguing with the oversight as to whether we should have Axminster or Wilton down the aisle, arguing over this and that and the other, falling out. God have mercy upon us. The kingdom of God is righteousness. And Paul hits the nail right on the head, doesn't he? I hope you forgive me for preaching like this tonight, won't you? I'm feeling very much at home with you. But it really is. It is righteousness. It is to do with right living before God. And we must never, never lose sight of this. And I tell you this, that unless and until there is righteousness, there can be no peace and there can be no joy in the Holy Ghost. And the Beatitudes, when eventually we come to them in Matthew 5, verse 1 to 12, are all about being in the attitude. That is what the Beatitudes are, being in the attitude. And God will secure in us the right attitude of heart, of mind, of spirit. So that basically, fundamentally, God has sorted us out and straightened us out and laid in us fundamental concepts which will keep us on the straight and narrow. And when that is so, friends, life will be wonderful. Life will be heaven on earth. Amen. I'm just trying to think of a little 
uh, rhyme that someone shared with me some months ago. Yes, it, it, it will come in a minute. About living with the saints. Yes, Eric knows it. You shared it with me, Eric. That's a different story. That's right. <laughs> How true it is very often, isn't it? It's one thing to look forward to living with the saints in glory, but to live with them now, that's another story. The great thing is we shall all be changed one day. You will not live with me as I am. And all the people said, <laughs> and I shall not live with you as you are. We shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye, and we shall be found in the image and likeness of Jesus Christ. Wonderful. But friends, we ought to be enjoying heaven on earth in the church. And I come back again, I can't help it. This thing absolutely possesses me. I'm through and done with anything that would hinder and ruin the fellowship of God's people. I want heaven on earth with you, as you are. And it can only be brought about as our basic attitude is right in the sight of God. And we are not judging one another on incidental and trivial matters but we are big enough in God to accept each other and to interpret the broad and basic principles of God's word. And I believe when that is so, our fellowship shall be sweet indeed. And then I move on to another point. Sixthly, the practical constitution of the kingdom. See, when we talk about seeking first the kingdom of God, we need, and with this I begin to draw in, to consider very carefully what the biblical definition of the uh, kingdom is. And here it is in Romans 14 and verse 17. The kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. That's wonderful. But righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. I briefly mentioned last week, just as we were closing, three aspects of the kingdom. The Godward aspect, the manward aspect, and the inward aspect. The Godward aspect is righteousness. The manward aspect is peace. The inward aspect is joy through or in the Holy Ghost. Now, brothers and sisters, I believe it is the devil's business to shortchange us. When Jesus said, seek ye first the kingdom of God, he meant the kingdom of God in his entirety. Amen. Amen. Not one aspect of the kingdom or two aspects of the kingdom, but each and every aspect of the kingdom. So that in its entirety, we embrace it and we experience it for ourselves. And we want righteousness. We want peace. And we want joy in the Holy Ghost. Our righteousness is living right, doing right, acting and reacting right in the sight of God. And when that is so, we are at peace one with another. For peace there literally means peaceable living. The ability to live without strife. Isn't that beautiful? And you see, when you're right with God, you can do that, can't you? In fact, when we are right with God, we must be right with our brethren. It can't be at any other way. John puts it in a different uh, context, but he says that if we claim to love God and we hate our brethren or we don't love our brethren, we are a liar and the truth is not in us. How can a man say that he loves God whom he has never seen when he can't love his brethren whom he has seen? And friends, we cannot be right with God unless we are right one with another. And if I fall out with you and I've got bitterness and rancor and malice in my heart against you, whoever it is, and I claim to be right with God, then I am guilty of a most awful and terrible lie. If I am right with God, I am right with my brethren. Because being right with him, I have the ability and the capacity to live peaceably with my brothers and sisters in the faith and to be at one with them. And I tell you this, when you're living right in the sight of God and you're living peaceably one with another, you are full of the joy of the Holy Ghost. It's thrilling, isn't it? Have you ever known that joy of the Holy Ghost? Isn't it great? Springs up every day we live. This wonderful 
wonderful, overflowing, overwhelming joy. Not happiness, that's conditional upon circumstances and conditions. But this joy of the Lord that becomes our strength and anchors the soul in every situation of life. And I could do with a little more of this joy, and I've asked the Lord to give it to me. And I've asked the Lord to give you a baptism of joy as well. So if our fellowship becomes more delightful and more joyful than ever, blame the pastor, his answer to his prayers. But I believe as God gives us righteousness and peace, we shall enter into joy. Isn't it thrilling that we read concerning Jesus? In Hebrews 1, 9, thou hast loved righteousness, hated iniquity, therefore God, even thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. Christ was anointed with the oil of gladness. Amen. Nothing miserable about him. Nothing depressive about him. I believe he was the most joyous person who ever walked this earth. And I would love to be like Jesus in that, wouldn't you? So whatever I'm going through, whatever pressures I bear, whatever problems I'm grappling with, there is a joy of God within me. I'm living right with him. I'm living peaceably with my brethren. And I'm entering into the fruit of Holy Ghost joy. Now it's joy in or through the Holy Ghost. It doesn't come naturally speaking. It comes supernaturally. As the Holy Ghost releases in us, as a witness, as an evidence, as a blessing, resulting from our right standing with God and our right standing one with another, something that is of the order of heaven itself. You see, God never intended we should be miserable. <laughs> Did he? He never intended we should. And yet I tell you this, there are so many dear believers who go through life so heavy, so burdened, so miserable, so depressed. How on earth they're going to cope in heaven, I don't know. <laughs> when the whole glory will just give expression to joy unspeakable and full of glory as we sing the anthem of the redeemed and praise God without limitation and restriction and inhibition and enter right in spiritually to a realization of who and what Christ is and what he's done for us and what our eternal state is. My word. And so may the Lord help us in this. So we have to develop the God word. We have to live right in his sight. We have to deliver the man word. We have to live at peace one with another. And we have to develop the in word, this joy in the Holy Ghost. And finally, as I close tonight, let me talk to you about the personal consolation of Matthew 6.33. And all these things shall be added unto you. That's interesting, isn't it? All these things. What things? Read the previous verses in the chapter.